theyeshiva.net. Okay, good morning, everybody. We're on the bottom of page Ches. Im Kolza. Uh-huh. So yesterday we learned how a uh, authentic Rav mentor, when he teaches, even if it's an individual discussion, that discussion, that insight, that drush, as he calls it, drush prati, that class, encompasses ten dimensions. It's a full structure. It's a full, or, so to speak, an organism with all the ten spheres involved. There's, of course, the, the seichel of it. There's the midas of it, the idea, the, the richness of it. And the idea itself, you have the chachma of it, the bina of it, the das of it. The chachma of it means to bring out the point. The bina is the development. The das is the intellectual application. The connect, connectiveness. Adam yada is chava. There's the bringing out the emotional relevance of it. The emotional application in life. And then the practicality. That's called nehi, netzach haid Also within himself. He can't just teach with his mind. He has to also teach with his heart or her heart. Dvarim hayoitzim, hayoitzim min halev. Not just dvarim hayoitzim min hamayach, dvarim hayoitzim min halev. It's a full experience. He is fully involved, fully present with every fiber of his being, literally from top to bottom. And the idea is presented in its full majesty, in its full parts of, you give the entire... Right, Zeus ha Torah Adam. Torah is compared to an Adam, meaning in every shtickle Torah you have a whole Adam, you have a whole organism. That's the idea. You have a whole parts of in in, in Isis of Kabbalah or Chassidus is called a whole parts of of ten spheres, an Adam. It's a full person. Person is not just a brain. The brain is vital. We live from the brain, but it's just a brain. You take a head without anything else. We know what it looks like. It's a death penalty, Herig. So. Sometimes there's spiritual beheading. Spiritual beheading means, you know, just give you brains, just give you a head. But there's no integration. There's no full, there's no full person. Whenever teaching is only intellectual, it may be very brainy. But if it's beheaded, so a, a person could chas v'shalom be beheaded and a, a shir can also be beheaded. In the sense, there's a brain and there's no heart, there's no feet, there's no legs. It's a very, very powerful, uh, unfortunately, very relevant idea sometimes. You can't teach only with your head, and you can't teach only the head dimension of it. There has to be a full integration, both from the teacher and of the idea itself, Adam. And then from the student, right? We have the teacher, let's call that the gavra. We have the shir, let's call it the chefza. And then we have the second gavra, the student, also has to show up. He says that's the difference between the Talmud Muvak and the Talmud who's not a Muvak. There's a Talmud who's more like a, you know, the difference between a, a spectator and a player. <laughs> you know the difference. The spectator is there for fun. You know, if the game is not going well, what do you do? You go home, or you get drunk, or you eat French fries, huh? Go to the next team. You go to the next team, you eat more French fries, you start texting and so forth. The player, if the game is not going well, he can't uh, say, I'm going to text, I'm going to drink, I'm going home, I'm going to make a barbecue, I'm going to a swim for a swim. You're, you're, you're in it. You're in it fully. There's good moments and there's difficult moments. There's exhilarating moments. And there's moments that, you know, you got to sweat it out. I would say that's the difference between the Talmud Sheinim, the Talmud, the Talmud Sheinim, you know, he comes for the show. The Talmud Muvak, he says, he will not miss a word. He understands that what's needed is the full dedication, the full trust. As he puts it, he becomes a chalol reikon mamish, a complete cavity, an open womb that is empty from everything else. And he will not lose a, a single, single word from his teacher. And he allows himself to be fully present. And therefore, he says, every drush will reconstruct his entire organism. New insights, new perspectives. He'll allow himself to be moved emotionally. He'll allow himself to be moved and transformed behaviorally. And with a profound pleasure. So on all levels, he too goes through a transformation, just like the teacher goes through a transformation. It's the transformation of the teacher 
that allows for the transformation of the student. If the teacher is only there with his, uh, you know, with his mouthpiece, the student will also be there only with the mouthpiece. You know that oldest anecdote about the professor who was coming every week to give a lecture in the university? And, you know, after 30 years, he got tenure already, and he was bored. So he said, what does he have to schlep, uh, travel an hour, and go to the classroom and everything? This is in the good old days of the tape recorder, all of our shalom, right? So he decided he could sit at home, tape the class, send the tape with a student, press the tape recorder in the desk, and all the students will come. What do they do? You sit, you take notes, they'll take notes. <laughs> Great, I'm a chai, he doesn't have to travel anymore. He sends a tape with one of the students, press play. It's like he's sitting there, what does he have to schlep and deal with people? He didn't like social life, he didn't have to like the good mornings and the pleasantries. After six months, he decided to come check it out. So he walks into the classroom and he sees his tape recorder is playing and on every desk there's a tape recorder. <laughs> Right, so uh, it's always what we call mida connected mida, mida connected mida. I'm giving you a tape recorder, you give me your tape recorder. I give you a mouthpiece, so you give me your ears. Yeah. So it's it's always like we learned earlier, kamayim haponim laponim, kain lev haadam ala adam. You know, it's the face I show the mirror, the face that I show the water that comes back. So the the two are the two are interdependent. The teacher can't expect the Talmud to go through a transformation if he's not going through a transformation. So that's the transformation on many, on many, many levels. It's a Rav and Talmud, you know, obviously there's many different levels, but it's the, we're talking here the ideal, the ideal mentor, the ideal teacher. Full trust on both levels. Then he explored the fact that this only comes with preparation. It must come with a lot of preparation. And as the Pasuk puts it in Eiv, uh, the Pasuk puts it in Eiv. Yeah. Azra v'yisapra, hechina v'gam chakra v'yoyim adam. And the Chazal point out that there's four terms here. He saw it, he told the story, he prepared it, he researched it, and then the Pasuk continues, Vayoymer la Adam, and then he told Adam. And Chazal learned from this fascinatingly that before everything Hashem told Moshe, he first said it to himself four times. And on a deeper mystical level, those are the four letters of Yud Kevavke, which are the genesis and the prerequisite for creation. It's the Yud and the He and the Vav and the He are the four, so to speak, the four stages of transformation that the idea goes through in the students, in the teacher's mind and in the teacher's soul, which where it hibernates before it can even be communicated, before the dibur. Vayoymer is already the next step. Vayoymer la'adam. And this is true with Torah, it's true with Bria Asylum, and therefore it's true in the marshal of the teacher as well, that there's four dimensions that parallel the Yud, and then the He, and then the Vav, the He. Two are pertinent to himself vis-a-vis -vis himself, and two are already the next stage where he's preparing himself vis-a-vis -vis the student, even though it's not communicated yet. And very generally, the difference of Ra Vayisapra, the first two stages is, within himself. The preparation within himself, the organization, the ability to be able to develop an idea on a level of Klal and on a level of Prat, right? The Ra seeing is the level of Klal, the full picture. The Vayisapra, the telling the story, is on a level of prat, the details. One without the other is flawed. The big picture is great for a big picture. But the small picture, zooming in, is just the details. It's the zooming in, but there's the zooming out. The ra and the vayisapra, which is chachma and then bina. Then there is hechina v'gam chakra. Hechina, now I have to prepare it for the recipient who could never experience it the way the teacher experiences it in his own mind, there's hachina. Hachina is also bederech klal, and then vegam chakra. Chakira is always scrutiny, investigation. A chaker, an investigator, is always about details. That The devil is in the details. <laughs> all criminal cases in history, all chakiras, if you learn in Sanhedrin, chakiras, drishas, what are chakiras? 
details, 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 details. You'll dissect it, and a real investigation will dissect it to a point where you can't even, you don't even realize how much you could dissect it. So this second phase is the teacher now still talking to himself. Still talking to himself. Looking at how the Maccabal will exist. Yes, yes, yes. Trying to see if it's yeah. the viewpoint of the Maccabal. Right, right. Because if he just stops after the first two stages, he got everything, but he's going to talk and it's going to be, you know, it's going to flood the, it's going to flood the student. It'll overwhelm him. Like we learned in the Maim of Yadaita, Musk, Vatofrish, Nun Zion from the Rebbe Rashab, right? The long Maim of Yadaita, that whole mashal about the idea of Tzimtzum. The idea of Tzimtzum is that you really have to create an empty space where you're not present in which the recipient can be present. In other words, to really imagine the other person, the other person's space, where they are intellectually, where they are emotionally, because the point of communication and teaching is that it should be absorbed by the other, not that you should express yourself. So it always has to be measured and tailored according to the keli. So that's the hechin of agam chakra. And that's the difference between the yud of shem havaya is chachma, the he is bina, the vav is taking the yud and bringing it down, and then there's the hay, which is the expansion of that. So there's the klal and the prat, the way it's in the teacher's mind. And then there's the klal and the prat, the way it's in the teacher's mind, not vis-a-vis himself, but vis-a-vis the, the student, the disciple, the Talmud, the pupil. And that's called shir b'koyach kol masha asad liyaz b'poyal. Which is a term in Kabbalah and in Chsidis that Hashem estimated b'koyach, in potential, everything that is going to come out in poyal, even before it's in poyal. You know, you have the whole thing the way it is still in, so to speak, an embryonic state, in a more state of potentiality, where you have everything, you have all the details. But at this point, it's still all in the mind of the one who's, who's giving it over. So you have Ra, Vayisapra, Hechina, Vigam Chakra, and then starts actually the Shir, Vayoymer La'adam. And all this happens before anybody knows, anybody sees. This is all within his own soul. Im despite all this, this is all true, absolutely true. Anurayim lepa'amim, we see that there's another dimension sometimes. B'shosh adorish letalmidei be'ez inyan, as he's teaching, as he's expounding on any topic, any inyan, any theme to a student. Noiflam loharav hamtsoyos chadoshos yoyser. Nailam harbe mikifisha siddha v'machshav tebinyan zesh adorish. They may fall into his mind, completely new ideas, novel ideas, much deeper and greater than what he organized in his thought. You know, he had a prepared script. The script could be all in his mind, but it's prepared. This is what he conceived. This is what he developed. As he's communicating, suddenly, oops, wow, this new, gigantic insight, innovation, idea, we call it, invention literally pops into his mind. Those epiphanies that he has precisely in the middle of the teaching and like, why couldn't this happen yesterday? Well, it didn't happen yesterday. It happens precisely right now. This is beyond what he organized. Suddenly as he's talking, what this, suddenly there's a question. He didn't realize this question and it's a very deep question. It's not a superficial question. Superficial questions he dealt with. But this is like a question that can shatter everything. It can, it can destroy everything. Why are you smiling? You're remembering something. Reb Chaim, Reb Chaim, I'm also thinking. And Valajan. Reb Yosheber Soloveitchik used to tell a story about his grandfather, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, Reb Chaim Brisker. He was brought as a Rosh Hashiv. He, he was for many years Rosh Hashiv in the Valozhina, the great Lithuanian Valozhina Yeshiva in Valozhina in Lithuania, in the Litta. The Rosh Hashiv at that time was the Nitziv. The Nitziv, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yehuda Berlin, was the Rav of Valozhina, the Yeshiva of Valozhina. And he had a different derech of learning there, Rabbi Chaim Salavechik. Rabbi Chaim Salavechik's father was also there, the Beis HaLevi, Rabbi Yosef Doiv, who Rabbi Yosef was named after. And there was some contention in terms especially of the styles of learning. The Soloveitchiks had their style, and the Nitziv had his style. And when Reb Chaim came, it wasn't such a simple simple process. So uh, 
he was going to give what's called a prabashir, you know, your, your, what is it called? The, the first lecture to, uh, <laughs> for the students to be able to uh, determine and ascertain if he's the right Rosh Hashiva. And they had the uh, three great rabbis there. He said that Zayda was prepared to speak on the suga of Eiloinis, a Masechta Yavamas. Masechta Yavamas is a complicated Masechta about Yibum and Zika. The suga, the suga of Eiloinis, and his Zayda was prepared to speak on that. And he got up to give, he got up to give the shear, and he gave the Myra Mekoimus what he's going to talk about. And there was a group of boys who were not interested in having him. They didn't want him as a Rosh Hashiva, so they prepared very well. Hopefully they'll be able to challenge him and, uh, you know, undermine the sugya and so undermine the shear. So he said that in the middle of his grandfather's shear, Reb Chaim, uh, somebody raised a question. Somebody raised a question from a Pirish Hamishnayis of the Rambam, quoting a Rambam that seemingly contradicted what Reb Chaim said, the basis that he built, the foundation that he built. And he stopped short and he thought for a few minutes and he said, you're right. <laughs> I have no shear. I got no shear. You're right. <laughs> and he walked down. He walked down. And for the opponents, it was a tremendous victory. Like, you know, can't get any better than this. Like, you didn't have to destroy him. He destroyed himself. There were three big Rabbonim there. And they said, this is the Rosh Hashiva you want. <laughs> this is a teacher you want. <laughs> it's his first time, his first presentation, right? It's the first impression. This is the first time. And Reb Chaim said there were students who were trying to defend it and, and answer and and show that he's not wrong. So Chaim said, we could find answers, but the question is better than the answer. We could find answers. You know, I, can, I can, as we say, weasel, weasel my way around, out of it. But the Emma says that this boy was right. <laughs> it said, I could find, Azoy, Azoy, you know, Shari Tirutsum Loininalo, there's an expression. The portals of answers are not locked. You could, you could fetch something. Yesh letaritz b'doichich, there's something like that. Yesh letaritz b'doichich, but it wasn't the emes. Sometimes it can happen within the teacher himself. This happens often. People who communicate and teach deep ideas. In the middle, you're struck by a question. Well, why didn't I think of this yesterday? Why didn't I think of it? I read this 20 times, 30 times. But there's a kushia mukha. It's, it's a very deep question. Oi, tirutz yoysin niflava amok. Or... A new insight, a new answer, a new explanation that is much deep. Something he did not conceive earlier when he was organizing it and framing it in his mind. Not the question or perhaps not the answer or the insight. Why? What happens? He prepared it. He worked on it. It's not like he, he just came to the classroom and uh, took it out of his sleeve. It was prepared. He worked on Why did all these insights not happen yesterday? Why is it that in the middle of the communication, there's like, mm, wow, that's a great idea, that's a great insight, that's a great question, I don't know how to deal with this. This is a whole new perspective. There's a few reasons for this. That could be too. You mean from, from the questions of the Talmud? Yeah, we'll soon see. The first is, Ha'alef, Ma'ashab ma'ashavin iskarim ha'oisis b'skira achas. Machshav is like a picture. You take a picture, boom. Skira means a scan, right? Skira, today we have scanners, so we know what it is. But the word skira, we have an expression, hakal niskarim, b'skira achas, and Rosh Hashanah. Hashem scans the world like with a scan. It's like you take this picture and you have it all there. Machshav versus dibur is like a scan. How long does it take to think about things? You know, when you daydream, right? You could think about, and in two, three minutes, you can cover hundreds of subjects. Uh, somebody might be doing it right now as I'm speaking. And then you wake up from your daydream, literally two minutes later, and like, what did you think about? Oh, it's going to take me two hours to say. Because machshav is literally like a scanner. It's like so many details. You just like, you know, you get it, and then you have to start communicating it. It's a whole different process. Or writing it down is, again, detail by detail by detail. Machshava relative to Dibur was like a cloud. But Machshava neskara ma'isis b'skira achas. Afilu behirur. 
שמהרה באוסיוס, איך לדבר, אם כל זה אין לו מחולק עם האוסיוס כל כך, כמו בדיבר בפועל ממש, שמחל כמו האוסיוס על ידי המצוס. Even here, there's something called machshava and here. Machshava is the very thought. Here is actually an organized thought of how you're going to say it. Here is like the intellectual script. So here is already much closer to Dibur than Machshava. Machshava is just, you're thinking about something. And you know that sometimes in 20 seconds, you can cover a whole, if you're preparing, let's say, a, a, a lecture or a presentation, once you have it, like in 10 seconds, you, you, you see it, like you have a picture of it. It's like the summation of it. But hero, that's not enough. Hero is actually thinking and formulating how you're going to say it. So hero is already much closer to the verbal presentation. But he says, still, when it's in machshava, that diversity, that fragmentation, that his chalkos, that division, the divisibility into oisius, is not like when you actually verbalize it, the poyal mamish and actualization, where the letters are now, each letter is vocalized and articulated individually through the hey matzai saped, there's the five sources of the 22 letters, right? Like aleph, ches, hey, ayin, come from the throat, and bez, vav, mem, pe, are connected to the, to the lips, the svasayim, if your lips are open, you're not going to be able to say these letters. The point is, when it has to be articulated, it has to go through that physical process of coming from your uh, vocal chambers and bringing, coming out, it can't be compared to the way it is in my mind, even when in my mind I planned, okay, I'm going to say this, and I'm, which is why it's a different process. And sometimes when you open your mouth, you get stuck because machshav is not enough. Hero is not enough. Now it's actually bringing it down. No, well, we're talking hero versus machshava. Hero versus machshava. You're talking about, there's an expression here, hure avera, kashem avera. Okay, those are different expressions. Hero generally means thoughts, right? But what's it mean, machshava and hero? So it's explained in Svarim. That expl- no, no. Machshava is the thought, the way it's in yourself. Like you, you're dreaming about something, you're just thinking about something. You don't have to prepare a presentation. Hero is like, okay, what am I going to say? You understand? So hero is much closer to Dibur. Because in hero, yeah, you need sentences and paragraphs, but it's still not like Dibur. So therefore, the, before the teacher speaks it, it's, a different, it's in a different world. It's still in a world of Klal. It's still Beskira Achas. Vizel Klal Gadol. And this is a klal gadol, a big principle in life. Shais chalkos hu mevarer. Koya chabirur always comes through his chalkos. Not through klalim, but through pratim. The koya of birur, what's birur? Birur is to clarify, to crystallize. We have an halacha, boirer, right? What's boirer in Hilchah Shabbos? Simen shin yod ches in Arachayim and Shulchan Aruch. There's boirer. What's boirer? Separating. Removing the filth. From the good part, that which is edible, that which from that which is rotten, that which is desirable, that which is undesirable. That's what all birur means. Birur means clarity. Borer, it's clear. Borer is to sift out, right? Mevarer. That's all the concept of birur. All birur happens through his chalkos. When things are general, you know, they're just big, big, big picture. There's no kayecha birur. All Kaya Chabir comes through fragmentation, through his Chalkos. You have to dissect it. You have to see the details. The five sources of vowelization, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That happens only by Dibor. In Hirur, it's still in my brain. It didn't go through that physical transformation. And that's why the Dibur is much more mechulak. Every letter is now articulated independently. Every word is articulated. In Hirur, it's almost there, but it's not there. It's still in the world of much more klal. You can get away with a lot of things in Hirur that you can't get away with Dibur. Because even though it's organized, but it's still organized for you, not for anybody else. That's why there's a tremendous, there's literally a quantum leap between Machshava, Hirur, and Dibur. Because Dibur is, it actually comes into the real world. It comes out of me and it's absorbed by a person. So there you're not, you see, when I'm, when I'm thinking about something, even when I'm thinking about it in terms of how to say it, I have 
the background behind the thoughts. So therefore, for me, the machshava is just the outer layer of my awareness, of my emotion, of my experience of it. But the audience doesn't have that. All they have are the words. So the words really have to contain everything. That's why sometimes people think they're ready to give a presentation because it's so clear in their mind. But they're not. Because what's clear in their mind is because they have that, they just get it. But nobody else gets it. So if the words have to contain the full depth of that, for you, the words don't have to contain much because they're just the outer layer of what you're feeling. But you don't know what I'm feeling. So the words have to contain everything. Now, when the klal goes into the prat, which is words, so he says, It's the schalkus that always creates koya chabir. When things are more nebulous, more celestial, more general, there will usually not be clarity. Just like when a person you know, sometimes expresses himself or is experiencing something. And it's unclear to him what is really happening. But if you'll dissect the words, then you could say, oh, this is coming from this. This is coming from this. And the more there will be hischalkos, the more there will be division, the more there'll be pratim, the more you'll be able to have birur, the more you'll be able to be mevarer. What comes from where? What belongs here? What doesn't belong here? Using the virus then in two different senses. First, a, a moment ago, using the sense of beer, like by Shabbos, literally separating this idea from that idea. Now using it in the sense of clarity. I mean, that's not, it's not exactly the same as Shabbos, but it's using it both ways. Yeah, yeah, both ways. Clarity, and, and, and clarity always means removing everything that, that clouds clarity, removing all the fog. Therefore, yeah. Not really. I mean, borer, borer, it's really all the same etymology. Mishnah Brura, same thing. That's what he wanted to do, Mishnah Brura. It should be a clear Mishnah. He writes in his introduction that because of all of the literature of the last generation, so the original Shulchan Aruch has so many more details, and he wants it to be clear. Right, so whenever you have to bring something into language, not only into machshava, from vision into machshava, and from machshava into hirur, and from hirur into dibur, there's a tremendous eschalkos. And whenever there's a eschalkos, there's always birur. Right? Eschalkos hu mevarer. Eschalkos does birur. Whenever you remain, whenever things remain in klal, you can get away with a lot. May have thought of Solas that he was going to buy around and pop into his head when he's giving. That's the vart. That's the vart. So when it comes into Dibur, right, there's a new stage of Biru that couldn't happen before. So that very subtle Psoilus that yesterday remained in the Shear now is identified and it's like, whoa, this is a problem. I got a big question here. Or a new dimension that was hidden comes out, is articulated. So Vizel Klal Gadol. Yeah, the speech itself brings out things that were completely hidden, because his schalkos is the mevara. You see, from the negative side, someone gets angry and says things. Right, the speech itself enrages, brings out things. The Rish Chacham, I think, writes that. Shai schalkos u mevara. As explained in many places, this is what we speak about. The klal needs the prat. We have in the Yud Gimel Midos Shatayr and Idresh's this klal of prat and prat the klal and klal of prat the klal. So the Chavzal have an expression, klal itzterich le prat. The klal needs the prat. You would think that the prat is only a detail that comes from the klal. But nonetheless, when things are more in a cloud, they can also be more hazy, more nebulous, more ambiguous. You don't get to see everything because it's not dissected. And you can get away with a lot of things. But the klal itzterich leprat, kemoshe bebina mevarer koyachachachma. Just like bina is mevarer, it dissects, it clarifies. That which in chachma is in a seminal point, in Bina, it's articulated, it's developed. Avol b'skiri is when there's a general scan, yuchal heyois hatoy ses atzmoy. You can deceive yourself. When things are in a state of klal, 
you're not challenged, you're not stimulated to really be honest with yourself. Because it's, yeah, generally, you know, uh, yeah, it works. You see this constantly in terms of uh, people's work within themselves. You know, a person could be very deceptive of themselves as long as the ideas remain very, very general. But when you get down to the nitty-gritty, to the details, it's much harder to deceive yourself. For Lechein Amar, that's why the Chazal say in Erevin, the Pasuk says, Chayim heim lemoitza ehem. Shloim HaMalach tells us in Mishle, Perik Dalit, that the Torah is life lemoitza ehem. What's lemoitza ehem? So the Gemara says in Erevin and Dalit, lemoitzi ehem, pepe dafke. It becomes life for the one who's moitzi, who brings it out, like moitzi, yoitzi, into the mouth. And that's where the sages um, highlight very much and, and praise that value of articulating it with your mouth, of learning verbally, not just in machshav. If you're learning yourself, you read it, and you think that's the best thing. They say, no, chayim heim, lemoitzi ayim, lemoitzi ayim bepeh. If you bring it out with your mouth, even when you're learning this yourself, to say it, to say it, to say it, mamash, with your mouth. Certainly, if you're teaching, you have to say it. If you have a chavrusa, you have to say it. When you're learning it yourself, you could just read and think about it. But the bringing it out verbally will give a different clarity. Why? What's the difference? It's the same person. The answer is the hischalkos. The hischalkos is the mevarer. When you just think about it, you can deceive yourself much more. Kemaimer, this is the expression of the Gemara in Brachas. Hashma la'oznacha ma'ashata moitzi mipicha dafka. Shema Yisrael, so literally, halachically, is you should hear with your ears that which you utter with your mouth. So when you say it, you should at least hear it. Somebody else doesn't have to hear it. But it should be verbal, it should be loud enough that I should be able to hear what I'm saying. On a deeper level, what it means is, Listen to what's coming out of your mouth. Because when it comes out of your mouth, you'll be able to hear more things than what you heard before it came out of your mouth. Before it came out of your mouth, you wouldn't hear, you won't hear everything. When it comes out of your mouth, it's on full display. This chalkos is there, you'll be able to notice things that you didn't notice before. This is even true when you're talking to yourself. When you say it to yourself, you say it over to yourself. Certainly when you're saying it to somebody else. I, why? Even though we're talking about somebody, the teacher, who estimated the difficulty of the student to absorb. Kushi haklita is the difficulty of absorption. And therefore, he already prepared in his mind restricted letters and sentences to explain it to him. In other words, it was already well developed, well formulated, well structured for this particular student. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about somebody who, who's, who's teaching on the fly. This was completely orchestrated. He already created a whole edifice in his mind. All the preparations in your machshava cannot compare to what happens when it actually leaves you and it encounters. It literally, in, 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 in Truma, we have a concept, it sees the house. When it actually Viroya, the teacher and the ideas see, they meet the face of the student. Upaigeya pnimiyas haratsun shalamashpia. Shayukla dafke bekeli hamakabal be pnimiyusai. Imkushi haklita shalamakabal shiroya sha oisis shaloi. Soiled in la chorehem ve enum nichnosim besoichiyusam. Oisis azalcha. A new dimension is being explained. The first idea is, Klal Godel is Chalkos, is the source of Birur. 
all mevaririm, all birurim happens from his chalkos. That's klal god. That's one klal. There's a there's a sefer called Ishim Veshitas by Reb Shlomo Yosef Zevin. He's the editor of Encyclopedia Talmudis. You know that yellow set. So um, he has a sefer called Ishim Veshitas. So in his essay on Reb Chaim Brisker, he explains very much the whole idea of of the, of the Brisker shit of learning. So he very much discusses this that what Reb Chaim did was he tried to disintegrate. To literally, you know, the, in yeshivas, there's always a lush and shnei dinim, right? There's two dinim. So it's not just, you know, there's two, whenever you can say there's two dinim, this is a din in this, and this is a din in that, and this is a gather in this, and this is a gather in that, and this is a chalois in this, and this is a chalois in that. The point here was not to say that there's two dinim, the point here was to take something and literally take it apart. And when you take it apart, then suddenly every aspect can emerge for what it is with much more clarity, with much more decisive clarity. That's the analytical idea of analyzing every suga, literally taking it apart to its core components as much as you can, to its core components, and then you right away see this is this piece, this is this piece, these things don't belong to each other, this has to do with that. When you don't do that, his chalkos, then it's much more nebulous, it's more ambiguous, it's more like in a fog. Same with the rub, you over. Categorizations. Same Categorizations, yeah. Categories, breaking it up. Now you think, what do you have to break it up for? You don't break it up because you want to break it up, you break it up because you want to put it back together. <laughs> You break it up because you want to see what it really is. Of course. Yeah, of course, of course. Of course. And you know, sometimes people take it to an extreme and all they're trying to do is break things up. It's like, it's broken up into a hundred pieces. It's good, let's put it back together. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Huh? Reverse engineering. Yeah. So this is true in intellectual ideas. It's also true in emotional ideas, right? Somebody is having very overwhelming, intense responses. But it's still in a state of klal. You will not have a koye chabir. I'm just angry. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm overwhelmed. But if you want to have clarity, if you, it has to be his chalkos. It has to be always his chalkos. His chalkos is not always easy. His chalkos is we have to take it apart. Yeah, tracing it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now his chalkos has a tedious component to it. it, it it's, you know, we 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 naturally resist it. It's like it's good. Let's just keep. Let's just leave it there. But by leaving it there, you're actually compromising your relationship with it because you can really fool yourself. You can really deceive yourself. The same is true also, by the way, in Avodah Hashem. In Avodah Hashem. A person could, let's say, read a Sefer and read about levels and Ruchnias and they, just, you know, it's just, it sounds good. It sounds good. And you could fool yourself. You can deceive yourself. It's not real. And the reason it's not real is because there's no real Eschalkas. There's no real Kaya Chabir. What belongs to me? What doesn't belong to me? What is this saying? What is that saying? That ability of Eschalkas seems like, it's like, why are you getting into the details? But it's the details that allow you actually to even have the full picture without deceiving yourself. So that's level number one. Level number two, what's being added is, yeah. I have a um, project at home that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I think about it, and it's kind of up there. But I haven't written it down, made the details. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. It sort of floats. It sort of floats. Well, it's my whole life. In the, club. <laughs> <laughs> the devil is in the details, huh? And the point you just said, little, said that really it's only right. by seeing the details that you first work back and, and see the cloud. Cloud, it's Tirich Leprat, yeah. In the very first year we had here three years ago, Chaya Vinish Lepsuba Vapoya, the 3,000 levels of Torah. Right. A good thing. 
Beshamai Basilo. Details and all kinds of different one is Havdullah, one is very good table. But it was only through that that you can come to a higher level of Chachma going up higher because you saw the Klal, and even that Klal was was with details relative to, yeah. to, to the Klal above. Yeah. Moving backward from the Protestants. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So the so so going into the world of Ischalkos creates o- always new types of birurim. Always new layers, new aspects, new details, new layers, levels of depth. Whether it's a new question that I didn't see before, or it's a new answer, or it's a new insight that only comes after he's speaking. He could not prepare it before. So this guy is preparing his shear for a month, okay, or two months, right? And it should all be there. And then suddenly as he's talking, boom. Why couldn't you come two months ago? And you get angry at your brain, you know? Where were you for two months? And the answer is, I was here, but this is just, you know, when, when it comes out, something happens. It's the magic, the magic of Eschalkus. But then there's another, another element, and that is, everything can be prepared. He knows the student better than the student knows himself. It's all formulated. But then as he says, the hachane in your mind doesn't come close to what happens when you see the face of the student. And he says, and these words are very important. He says, there's now an encounter of two forces. Poigeya, poigeya literally means nifga, you, vayivga bamokam, you, huh? Strider, you meet, you meet, you encounter. Two things encounter each other. The pnimius haratzen of the mashpia, that he wants the student to absorb it, the pnimius. He's not just interested in giving a speech and running away. He cares. He wants this person should be changed, should get it. Not just say he got it, but got it. Pnimi Yusai means it becomes him. It's not the teachers anymore. It becomes the students. That's a de- deep, that's what a teacher is. What's the definition of a teacher? You can't be a teacher if you don't care that the student should really absorb it. If you just want to express yourself so you could sit in your house and express yourself. You need people, so put down, you know, pieces of furniture and so on and so forth. The idea is there has to be a real rutzen that he, it bothers him. It means much to him that he should get it with a plimius, that it should be, he should own it, the student should own it. That rutzen meets something else. What does it meet? It meets kushi haklita shalamakabo. There's now a friction. The desire of its, its beautiful words, the real desire of the teacher that it should be absorbed is in Pegeya. It encounters the Makabal who's just not getting it. He's just sitting there looking at you. <laughs> huh? And it's not penetrating. It's not Klita. Klita means it's not being Niklat. It's not being absorbed, right? Or a Miklat. In modern Hebrew, they have Klita. Klita means the absorption of the Olim, right? Absorbing them. You can make Aliyah, but you don't have where to live. You can't live in the airport. Klita means you have to, it has to become you. You have to have a house, you have to have a job. You have to be able to be absorbed in a land, right? Kushi haklita, huh? Tikshadat v'kesha, yeah, yeah. So therefore, the two things meet. What happens? Shiroye sha'oysyus shaloy soildin l'achoyreyem ve'enim nechnosim b'toichi yusom. You know what soildin means? Yad soyledes boy, Right? Yatsay letters boy. You remember in Hilcha Shabbos, right? The, the water is one that your hand gets burnt. The letters are recoiled. When, when, letters boy means I touch the water and I, I recoil. I push back because I don't want to get burnt. If the, that's, that's a level of heat. In Halach, it's called Yatsay letters boy. Your hand recoils from it. It's like it's too hot. And that's a sheer in halacha, Yatsi letters, but she so says, shaloi, the letters are sold in lacharayim. The letters are coming back to you. They're not going in. They're literally like a ball bouncing off the wall. It's like you can you can see that your words are not going in. They're coming right back to you. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So 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 there's the so there's this friction. The teacher wants it should go in, but as he looks at the person's face, he sees. Everything is just coming right back to him. <laughs> he basically is hearing himself. That's what's happening. This he couldn't do yesterday. He couldn't do this for two months. 
because he wasn't seeing the face of the student. He was imagining everything, but it was all in my mind. It was all in my heart. He meant well. Everything was good and organized, but now in actuality, when it's happening, there's a whole new reality happening, and that is it's just not going in. The ISIS are just flying right back at you. When he sees this, and he has to see it, what happens now? This is literally an emergency mode, subconscious. He is forced to find within his resources a new way, a new marshal, a new story, a new illustration to be able to get through. He now looks, his mind looks for the information, for ways of communicating that which he didn't prepare yesterday, because he didn't have to prepare it yesterday, because yesterday he thought it was all good. But in the actual encounter, there is a challenge that he has to now overcome. Maybe a new language is needed. Maybe the language is a wrong language. It's not just another explanation. It's like the whole paradigm is not working for this person. So what happens? Where does he go to? Yesterday he went to his mind. Where is he supposed to go to now? So he says, This is somewhat hard to explain. But is a term that's used in many of the Rishonim. The Ramban uses it right in the beginning of Bereshus. It's actually a Greek word, hylic energy. And it represents something in the state of potentiality. Right, the Ramban describes the beginning of creation. The Ramban writes this in the 1200s. It's eerily similar to what's described today as the Big Bang. But the Ramban says that Hashem Himtzi, right, Nekuda Achas, that the whole universe began, this is what he writes, with one little seminal point that came from a state of Hiuli, of, of potential. And now it's just one seminal point, which is still a Hiuli, and now it expands and expands and expands. And the Gemara says that the name of Shin Dalad Yud, Sha, Shin Dalad Yud is Sha'amar La'olamai Dai. God told the world, enough, stop. Because <laughs> if it expands faster, there's no world, everything just dissolves. This is fascinating. So, uh, so this is what Ramban describes, writing in the 1200s. So this is just one example of the hiuli, which is when something is in a state, what is it called, prebiotic soup? Prebiotic soup, right? When, uh? Primordial. Primordial. primordial soup, prim primordial soup, primordial cholent, it's Thursday. So the ayin is a state where relatively it's nothingness, but that has everything in it. The teacher now is compelled to go to a place that's called to go back into the idea reaching its ultimate core in the state of potentiality that was not revealed, which is entrenched somewhere in the soul that knows. In other words, when we have an epiphany, Balatanya explains, when we have an epiphany, we have an where did it come from? Where did it come from? There's information that I read and I see what you're writing or what somebody is writing. But I'm reading something, I'm trying to understand it, I don't understand it, and then I get it. Where did it come from? Or I have an idea, where, where did it come from? Nobody told this to me. And the answer, of course, is it came from you. <laughs> it came from what's called Seichel Hiyuli, Hakavua Benefesh HaMaskelos. The soul knows, the soul understands, but I don't have access to it. Today we would call it it's unconscious or it's subconscious. And then a window is opened from the Seichel Hiyuli to the Seichel Hagoli, right? We learned in a Maimah about the snow, the Koyach HaMaskel, it's called. It's the source of Chachma. And they're like, wow, I got it. We, we, somebody put it into your head? The Nefesh HaMaskel is a weir. It gets it. But I have no access to it. It's completely unconscious. And then once in a while, something opens up and a little bit of it is revealed. As this teacher is standing there with that student, what can happen often is in that deep encounter between his desire and deep, deep yearning for it to be absorbed and the student's blockage, challenging the teacher to go to a much deeper place within himself and bring out from the seichel things that he could not find yesterday. He didn't have access to that level of depth. This is also true, by the way, emotionally. 
sometimes when you're standing in front of a very difficult situation, a difficult moment, it challenges you to go into a place of yourself that you never articulated before. You always knew it, but you didn't know that you knew it. You didn't have either the patience or the clarity or nothing in life forced you to be able to access that level of information. You know, but sometimes that level, that level of information now, without it, you can't continue. Good therapist. Huh? Good therapist. Yeah. Make you have this encounter. Yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. Huh? That very thing to students, something about. Of course, of course, of course. But that process came to all of us, the student would acknowledge right. the question, or in other words, even the most perceptive teacher can't know what a student doesn't know. I guess you can include it from what, the point here is that from the, from the face. The face. Yeah, yeah. Or what is it as a recognition that is that is not cognitive. Someone who is lectured for thousands of hours recognizes when the oysters are flying back. Yeah, that too. Yeah, hundred percent. So new deep things will become, will be triggered, will be aroused through the light that returns. Oir means he's giving a light and it's not being absorbed; it's bouncing off and coming back to him. As it comes back to him, this is fascinating, it goes into a deeper place. You know, when you're playing handball, the real action happens from the balls that, the rebound. The rebounds are always more powerful. Six balls. I see you're a player. Why? Because squash. <laughs> yeah. Throwing the ball has power, but it doesn't compare to the momentum and the drama that is created through rebound. So the teacher is giving, he's throwing the ball, but now the ball comes back. It comes back with such force that it hits him in a place that he never felt before. That's called Urchheiser, the rebounding light. It hits him in a place that it didn't hit him before because of that friction. And it brings out the Ne'alamas, the new secret. This happens even more if the student actually challenges, if he's raising those questions, if he's like saying this doesn't make sense. The famous Gemara, Rabbi Yochanan and Rish Lakish. In Masechta Bab Metziah, Rabbi Yochanan was the Rebbe who actually transformed Rish Lakish's life and turned him into a Baal He suggested him to his sister. They became brothers-in-law and he became his Talmud and he became his Chaver. And when Rish Lakish passed away, Rabbi Yochanan could not live anymore. He was devastated. And Rabbi Yochanan explained. Yeah, what, some form of melancholy, the Gemara says. He was, yeah. Shaydei shayamaksha chavdalat kushis. He would ask 24 questions, Rish Lakish. Umayisiv chavdalat piruka. And challenging Rabbi Yochanan to give 24 answers. Memele marvach shmaitza. The Allah became har chavadik, the Gemara says. Everything became clear. It was the challenges of Rish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan couldn't prepare before. But Rabbi Rish Lakish questioning him brought out, it challenged him. It was the rebound, the ball going back, the question coming back, like your message is not being absorbed. And that brings out a whole new light, a whole new depth. Huh? You sometimes see it in the world of education very clearly. Sometimes parents educate their children in a certain way, but they're living in la-la land. You know, they think they're doing a perfect job. And then one of these kids suddenly speaks up, you know? Which when they're four, they didn't speak. When they're nine, they didn't speak. When they were 12, they didn't speak. At the bar mitzvah, they didn't speak. They just did everything. But then suddenly there's the archeiser, right? And it hits you in your gut. It's like, whoa. <laughs> and suddenly... Everything you know, you start to know, which before that you were in a fog, you clouded yourself, you deceived yourself. But the challenge, the ch all types, there's intellectual challenges, there's emotional challenges. There's deep, deep challenges, and they bring out from you levels of awareness that you couldn't have without it. That's what Rabbi Yochanan said. The Gemara says when Yishlakish passed away, Rabbi Yochanan was so sad, they put somebody there, a Talmud, 
who was uh, bringing proofs to everything Rabbi Yochanan said. Whatever Rabbi Yochanan, he was genius. Whatever Rabbi Yochanan said, he proved it. So Rabbi Yochanan told him, Atu daina the shaper kamina. You think I need you to tell me that it's a good? I don't know that I'm saying a good idea. I'm the one who said it. I don't need you to support me. I need you to challenge me and tell me that I'm wrong. Don't tell me that I'm right. Tell me that I'm wrong. Atu loyadana the shaper kamina. I don't know that I'm saying that I'm saying good. I want to hear what you what I'm not saying right. Huh? The Gemara says in Tainus, I've learned much from my teachers, more from my friends, and from my students more than anyone else. Why? From his rabbis? I understand he learned. Because it's the Orichoyza that comes from the Talmud. It's the expression of the Gemara. As a result, Shmaitza is the halacha, the shmua, the halacha. Marvach, marvach comes from the word revach. Harchava, right? Revach tasimu, space. In other words, the halacha now is expansive. It's clear. It has a lot of space. It sits comfortably. When something is tight, it doesn't sit comfortably. It doesn't belong here. When something is settled, it's comfortable, right? There's a lot of space around it. Like you're sitting comfortably. The halacha is... is ingrained, entrenched, it's solid, it's settled, it's settled, all the dust settled. Okay, now goes a third explanation. Why in the teaching new ideas come in? So this is going to be a third explanation. We'll basically Hashem continue next time. Uh, I'm so struck by these words. Tachin achato osios mitzud samim lahaspil osel. This mom is such echoes of the Rashad's words in that mind of Yatayom. It's really yeah. It's really just yeah yeah. It's very very poetic. Really very. Those words are very very poetic. Yeah. Shakespearean. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the student allows the teacher to reach into his own subconscious. That's the Urchhäuser. Yeah, it's very intense. So this, with this, with this, today was two explanations. We see. Yeah, the first one was his schalkos is always the source for more birur. And since dibur is a schalkos, just articulating it that way will bring out stuff that don't belong here. You know? We, we all know this when you write something, right? Everybody has ideas. Write it down in an article, and suddenly you'll see 50% of what you thought belonged there goes to the garbage. This is redundant. This is superfluous. This is actually a contradiction. What happened? You were forced to articulate it. When you have to articulate it in words, on paper, it's a different beer. Things become clear. In your brain, you can play games with yourself much more. We all know that, right? That's step one. That would be even if you're writing it for yourself, if you're talking to yourself. Of course, it's more when you speak to somebody else because when you're talking to yourself, you know, you don't have to finish a sentence. So that's also true. But the second concept is the exclusive relationship. It's the, it's the encounter. <laughs> the ball got to hit the wall. It's hitting the wall. And these are explanations for what? for what? For why in middle of the process so many new things happen that this teacher could not anticipate. Yeah. I'm preparing for a month. <laughs> why didn't I think of this question? Because even though with all the preparedness you do, going back to the first explanation, you think that you really did the ultimate scholar. Right. But since you didn't speak it out. Right, right, you right. Senses, you never right. Really as much as how you thought you'd right. with the hay, the final hay, yeah. you still yeah. really Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you finish with one student, then you go to the next one, then it's going to, you know, you have to begin again in a different way. Yeah. So your subconscious is under the... Always. Bushel is towards God and Moishim. Exactly. So where do we need to connect more to the rabbi that I want to talk? What is the more worse for a regular person? Yeah. I explain that. Meaning, what do I need to focus on? Stand on the rabbit to do or what's happening? Like when I'm a father, I'm a father and a student.
Yeah, well, every real teacher is a student also. You can't be a real teacher if you're not a student. Teacher. You can't stay a student. Right, and everyone is a teacher on some level. Yeah, everyone has their hashpa. Uh, <laughs> everyone is, is a teacher in some form. You know, everybody has their sphere of influence. Yeah. 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 Klal Godel. Klal Godel. Feedback, huh? Ah, or Khazer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When she is in the Schalkos, she is not in the it's a challenge, one big challenge. Oiris, Kailam, Neshamas, Oilamas. There's no. Um, when we're going to have a Hemshah, the Hemshah, the Hemshah, we jump to. We're going to get back to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to get back to it. Yeah, we changed, we changed the subject. But we're going to get back to it, yeah. Verstanden? Ich Salat, Salat wird Yeah. 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 And when you don't mix, there could be more achdos. Falsch, it's not false. It's not false. If I know who I am and you know who you are, we could connect. If I think I'm you, you think I am me. Same thing. You're not. You're not real anywhere because it's just delusional. And the moment you see reality, you're... The Klal Godel Bechsidus Chabad. Kol Birur Aydei Yis Chalkos. The Gans Chabad is also. It's a Klal Godel. Mamash a Klal Godel. Huh? there was a bacher who once told me, I eat in Eretz Yisrael and Eretz So he told me there was a, he was in a yeshiva, it was a Chabad yeshiva in Lud, many years ago. There was a yeshiva there, his name was Reb Melech Kaplan. 
And he was like 14. I think he was from a Yemen or from one of the countries. And it was hard for him in the yeshiva. But he was, he was working very, very hard. And he said he came over to the Rosh Hashiva one day. They were learning a Tysus. He didn't understand the Tysus. So he asked him. So he said, he looked at me and explained it slowly. And, he, and when I finished, when he finished, he said, Hey, Vanta. I said, Lo, Lo, Vanti. So I, he explained it again. Hevanta, lo hevanti. So he explained it a third time, trying to explain more. And he says, it was so frustrating, I started to cry. I started to cry. So he says, Rosh Hashiva took me, and, and he gave me a big kiss. You know, So I told him, ah, achshav ani mevin. Achshav ani mevin. Achshav ani mevin. Ganz gut, huh? Achibur, he wasn't just teaching uh, information. Oh, la vie texte. No, la vie tois. Schof. Hamor noise is schof. Yeah, he could have said, well, was a fatam, you know what they say, fatam te kop, fashtop te kop. If you'd go to sleep early, you would done that. If you would eat less, if you would play less recess, or today we say bless on yes, right? He could have said all that. Whatever. But he understood. He understood. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.